The president and I are pleased with the manner in which we are moving toward the 21st century by building a very long bridge made of a wooden bridge, as it were, will be covered and sublime in helping people in the middle of that bridge. We move through to cross a wooden bridge built by the president and myself. We think that this may yet make everyone happy, and this wooden bridge will lead to a new century of prosperity, particularly for bridge builders and wood suppliers, as promised by the president and myself. As we cross the bridge, we have built to stand upon a platform built by contributions the president and I have not personally solicited, but which have nonetheless arrived unsolicited from friends in the global community, with whom we have had many friends to call upon. Though we did not discuss the money, we discussed other topics relating to the resources needed to build the bridge. Though in building this bridge to the 21st century, the president and I urge caution to guard against unfounded worries about inflation. Um, alright. Welcome aboard. Yeah, get used to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you haven't figured it out by now, that's kind of our thing, I, I guess. I mean, I just figured that out, so if you hadn't figured it out, yeah, no shame. No <laughs> um yeah okay, uh, you know what I, i'll just i'll just uh, i'll just say it straight out so that people don't have to be like what is he talking about that's a it's a quote from pinky in the brain the one where he they're doing winnie the pooh there you go i transcribed it it took a while from that episode because there's a lot of dialogue over it but now you don't have to drive yourself crazy if you recognize it but don't remember what it's from but i mean isn't that the point you want people to go crazy trying to think of it no in some cases i don't also, the 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 uh, the music in the other episodes, um, there's a, there'll be episode. a link. In, there'll be a link in the description because if there, I don't want anyone to suffer through the same thing I had to suffer through when you hear a bit of a song and nobody knows what it is, and every time you try to ask someone what's this song, some Weisenheimer is like, oh, that's Darude Sandstorm, and it's like, can you stop saying that? It's I know it's not Darude Sandstorm. I just want to know what the song is, and then it's seven years later. I mean, you'd Nobody be surprised. Else is going through this. You'd be surprised how many times the answer was to read Sandstorm, though. No, it's never to read Sandstorm. There was a time when it was. Anyways, what are we talking about today? To read Sandstorm? Yes, we've just changed the topic on the fly. That's what we're talking about now. Forget yeah, Swamp right. Thing. We're talking to read Sandstorm. Yes, you see, it goes like this. That's what I imagine. I imagine it's like the uh, the audio version of epilepsy. Ow! <laughs> All right, let's anyway. get on. So yeah, no, we're actually talking about Swamp Thing. This has been and, uh, the Darude podcast. Thank you for coming. Saying uh, podcast time, it's probably been about a week since our last episode, but a little behind the scenes secret for you, it's only been about five minutes for us. Yes, actually, as it turns out, we haven't uploaded anything yet, so I mean, there so, I mean, are no comments or letters or anything. It's yeah, not got, real. It's not real yet. Right now, it's just a bunch of files on our computer in a pipe I mean, af after this, we'll have four. Do you want to upload one after that point? Eh, I mean, four or five, probably a good buffer before we start. I don't know. We should, uh, you know, I'll just, did you make a video for uh, the, for number one already? Yeah, all the videos up, up till, uh, up till today are made. So we've got two videos all ready to ship and uh, you know, by the end of today, we'll have two more. So then I might do that later. I might, I might just write up the description and actually publish the first episode. Go for it. Um, I mean, honestly, we're probably going to be recording. If we do, it'll probably be on Saturdays anyway. So that well, seems as good well, as any day. Well, next it. next Saturday, I will not be able to record. I guess I should probably tell you that. Uh, well, oh. good thing we have a buffer. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, good thing um, we've already recorded episodes in advance. All right. Well, let's. Uh, so let's, uh, this is part two. Th this is the this is the fourth episode of the podcast, but also it's actually the only the second episode because you're not supposed to watch the first two episodes. <laughs> um. <laughs> But this is part two of the Swamp Thing retrospective, and it's a direct sequel to the preceding video, which was probably entitled something like Third Time's the Charm. Please don't watch the other videos. Thanks. Swamp Thing retrospective part one. If yeah, I had to guess. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Anyways, so we just talked about the first six issues of the original series, but uh, specifically we're talking about the Len Wine run, the very first entry into the Swamp Thing canon comprises yeah, so. the 13 issues. So yeah, now unless we're we, moving on to issue seven. Yes, yeah, so unless we uh, 
unless we run off on a million tangents again, uh, we should be able to cover the last seven issues in this episode. So I guess uh, yeah. well, just I jump mean, right into it. it. Cut out tangents entirely. I'm pretty sure we could cut down the runtime of this podcast to like 45 minutes. But I mean, some tangents are great. You need some tangents. If you didn't have tangents, what's the point? <laughs> yeah, tangents are the spice of podcasting. Is this the one? Oh, wait. I think I'm looking at issue 8 right now. We need to look at issue 7. Yes, I believe that's where we are. Yeah. Let me Let me get it open here. Is this the one? Let me crack open this enormous book. This this thing is an absolute pain to read, I feel like I should say. It's, it's heavy. Not. This book is heavy and awkward. No, I, you just hold it with one hand. I mean, yeah, but then that one hand gets really tired <laughs> after a what while. If you do it right. I don't know. I usually kind of like prop it on my lap with one hand under it, sort of. I don't know. I figured out a way to hold it properly that is sort of comfortable. Anyways, uh, issue seven. We are going to Gotham. Yep. And guess what? It's a crossover episode. You'll never with guess Superman. with who. It's with Superman. <laughs> yes. Superman is there, and also, um, what's his name? Kite Man. He's there, I too. Yeah, so I guess I feel like for that joke to work, I should have said someone way more obscure. Yeah, I was going to say someone obscure, but then you came in with Superman. <laughs> yeah. I know I, so I killed many that one. obscure characters. Uh, let's see. Okay, off the top of your head. Man. All right, most obscure character I know. Um. Oh wait, most obscure? Well, I can, I can think of something more obscure than Resurrection Man. Well, are we talking? Okay, I guess what category? I know a lot of obscure characters, but are we talking like specifically in DC Comics? Well, I mean, I think if you wanted to do most obscure comic book character, you could probably just say Galahad or whatever its name was, because I don't think anyone knows that that comic exists besides you and me and like one other person. Eh, I don't know. Um, even, I've never been able to find any record of that comic exhibit. Yeah, it, for those of you that have no idea what we're talking about, uh, I think it's a, a cousin of mine actually wrote a comic book. I have copies of the first two issues, and they're the only copies in existence as far as I know. Um, but, I mean, they're they're professionally made, and uh, yep. yeah, they're, they're there. they exist. That's all I can they say. Exist. They're not, they're not that sure bad. I sure haven't been able to find, I sure haven't been able to find any yeah, information yeah. on them. Yes, I mean, I would love to read more of it if there are more issues. But I'm not uh, even sure there. If there were, I don't know if I'd be able to even find out. Yeah, I don't. I yeah, I say I can't find any record that Galahad. that comic exists anywhere. It's not called Galahad. It's called uh, what was it called? Gabriel, I believe. Oh wait, Gabriel. Like as in the angel Gabriel, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what they're going for. Do you remember who it was published by? What the publisher was? Uh, it was like Peter, I think Peter. Or oh, oh, Pat. Oh, wait, no, the uh, the publisher. Yeah. I don't. Uh, we could we could figure that out off mic though. Not too late. This is now the Gabriel podcast. <laughs> I, I'd have to go take it out. I don't know. Um, now, let's see. There's three things. There's three uh, Gabriels. Thanks. Gabriel 1995 by Caliber. Gabriel 2008 by Moonstone. And Gabriel sure. 2012 by Blackhearted Press. Well, this one would have been probably in the 70s or 80s. Uh, let me think. I think the same. They they did a comic also. The same. I think we actually looked into it one time. We found out the publisher also had a comic called Thoughtful Man. Thoughtful Man. And well, I think that okay. one had a lot more on it. The oldest Gabriel comic of the three that I just said was 1995, and uh, it appears to be a one shot, which I kind of now just want to read out of curiosity. Story uh, story by Jim Alexander, art and cover by David Hill. In a world ruled by religious authorities, a man realizes he may be the only one who can stop a rampaging demon. Gabriel and his ex-wife must elude the Knights Templar to save Scotland's spiritual leaders. Yeah, that, that ain't it. In black and white. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the one the one I'm talking about is in black and white, but it is not... Yeah. Is it Marrier and Crew Productions? Thoughtful. That's not how you spell that. Thoughtful, man. Uh, heck, you know what? I'm just going to go find the comic book now that we're fully oh, committed hey, to talking found, about this. I found Thoughtful, man. Yeah, I, I think it's Mary let me, Crew Productions. Yeah, let me go. I'm gonna, I'm just you know I'm gonna go off mic for a second here. Uh, keep them entertained. I'm gonna go find the actual comic book so I can tell you for sure what who made it. This one is Charles Marrier. All right, I'll be back. First printing. Well, it's just me, I guess. Welcome to the me cast. What is Mary? Wait. No. 
Oh my gosh, the only one is Marrier. If you go to Marrier and Crew Productions, the only thing here is Thoughtful Man. No. Uh, Thoughtful Man. A each Every issue features a completely powerless hero who survives by blind, stupid luck. Is it the same guy? There's no images for the covers. The only issues that are available for purchase are issues 10 through 13. And then there's a second series that was published in a different thing. It appears to be some sort of anthology comic. And uh, there are only two of them available. Charles Marrier was the guy. All right, so let's find out Charles Marrier then. If we look up Charles Marrier, what do we get to? Charles Marrier. Speaking of which, you guys played Alan Wake. I just got into it, and then it turns out I'm that back. they remastered it. So I it's found like, them. Well, once again, what did you find? I found them in the comics. Oh, yeah, cool. So, uh, yeah, Gabriel by Marrier and Crew. Can't, uh, I don't see any publishing year on it, but it cost $1.75 per issue at the time. So maybe that gives you an idea how much I mean, around when they came out. It's likely an indie comic. Yeah, I mean, it totally is. I think this is Marion Crew, I'm pretty sure, was just like the name of the people that wrote it. Well, yeah, like, the guy who wrote Thoughtful Man is Charles Marrier. And I don't think this one was written by Charles. I think this one was written by Peter, who was my cousin, I believe. And he, uh. Hey, here we go. Oh, yeah, there's like a whole. You know, I, I should let you borrow these some. Oh, yeah, you've read them before, haven't you? No. Oh, well, I'll, I'll remind me to let you borrow them sometime so you can read them. I mean, pretty... Alright, yeah, just bring them over the next time you're over here. Yeah, I'll do that. These are definitely worth a read. But wow, they are crazy. There's like some weird, like, kind of parallel universe chronicles of Narnia kind of thing. I think the whole idea is like the main character is like a guy named Gabriel who is dead and then gets like recruited to be some sort of like angel superhero and fight demons that are like declaring war on earth or something i don't even know there's only two issues so they don't really get to very thoroughly develop anything but i forgot to start the stopwatch <laughs> oh so we're at 12 minutes 26 seconds so well i can't i can't fast forward the stopwatch yeah why don't why don't they have that like on stopwatches why can't you like input a time as the starting point for a stopwatch that would help me so much i guess you're just supposed to lap it i guess really help no not really uh, Gosh dang it. About clock. Well, I can't. Well. Anyways, uh, this issue, run. this episode is not supposed to be about uh, obscure, vaguely Christian comics. <laughs> Why not? This is a Christian podcast, after all. Yes, but, I mean, I don't know. And I'm not even, I say vaguely Christian, I mean, there's nothing in the comic that would make you think it's a Christian comic. I mean, the name Gabriel is kind yeah, of Yeah, other than the name Gabriel, the fact he has a cross on his mask... And on you know, his belt. There's nothing, there's nothing Christian in this except for all the Christian iconography. <laughs> I mean, and the there's... fact that he's named after the angel in the Bible. Yeah, but like nothing that happens in the comic like reeks of like a Christian comic. I mean, it's actually pretty violent. So like a lot more violent yeah. than a Christian comic probably would ever be. Maybe it was written by Jack Chick in secret. What the heck? This Sorry if you. What? Sorry for uh, anyone. If you hear just heard a bunch of technical bloops, uh, my computer just gave me some weird notification. Uh, yeah, you you wouldn't have. Oh my gosh, it's trying to tell me that I need to backdate or that I need to back up my hard drive or whatever because my external's not currently connected to my computer, and it's having a nervous breakdown because it's trying to figure out where to send my backups to. Oh, do you have it automatically set to send downloads to there? No, it just it, it periodically backs up when that when that isn't when my external is connected, it backs up to that automatically. When it's not connected, my computer has a nervous breakdown occasionally. Anyways, that's beside the point. So uh, we're 15 minutes in. Maybe we should actually start talking about Swamp Thing. <laughs> All right, you j just start talking about the Batman. Yeah, so uh, the Batman one. Um, open the book back up. Ugh. Get my bicep workout as I pick up this enormous book. Oh, look, I just so happen to open it to the middle of SU7. So yeah, basically uh, starts off with Swamp Thing showing up in town. Uh some guy is walking around in a coat. Swamp Thing is like kind of stalking him. Uh, yeah, Knight of the Bat, I guess, is the name of this issue. 
And uh, basically, yeah, so Swamp Thing breaks into a cost or into a clothing store, steals his trademarked hat and trench coat to go incognito. He's still got the dog too, his old dog. Yeah, the dog is still falling. Oh yeah, now the dog's with him instead of Matt Cable. Because I guess yeah. after the last one, it just uh, decided to stick with him. So the he dog's following him. He breaks into a store. I, yes. I love. He breaks into a store to get the coat, and the clothes, and to get the hat and trench coat, and then immediately cops start shooting at him, thereby ruining the coat and trench coat. Yeah, it's like, well, that did us a lot of good. Which I mean, honestly, nice subversion yeah. of expectations, I guess. And Mr. E is here, and he's oh, like, yeah. uh, he's talking to the board of directors at the Wayne Foundation, and Bruce Wayne is there. And this guy, you know, he's your standard. I mean, he's a cor he's a corporate executive in a '70s comic. He who who isn't Bruce Wayne? What do you expect? Yeah, this Mr. E guy. I find his name is Nathan Ellery. Yeah, and he's a good guy that does charity stuff. Yeah, but Bruce Wayne knows that he's not. Also, look at like what the one, two, three, four, the fifth panel on page, uh, page is four, I think. I don't know, is it the one where, he, where he's talking to him and then he gets his Batman suit? Yeah, that, that is the least Bruce Wayne I've ever seen Bruce Wayne look. Which panel? The fifth panel of that page. Oh, is it the one where he's got like a weird haircut? Oh, yeah, he does not look Only like... in this one panel. He does not look like Bruce Wayne at all. He looks like... It does look a bit odd. Alfred looks fine. Yeah, Alfred's fine. Alfred here in the back. Bruce Wayne looking... I don't know, I can't even think of what he... Kind of like Steve Buscemi. <laughs> Vaguely. Steve Buscemi. No, maybe. the outfit yeah, looks not. more like Steve Buscemi. Oh my god, you're right. Okay, anyways, Batman suits up. Oh yeah, so uh, I guess we should get back into, actually, the recap. So basically, Swamp Thing blows up some police cars because they're chasing him. I mean, he doesn't kill anybody, he's just like... Batman, does... Batman's doing his usual Batman thing, and then he sees the... bat. To, he's trying to stop the Conclave, but then it turns out... Oh, wait. So yeah, they don't know... We know because we've been watch we've been reading the last seven issues, but uh, they don't know yet that Mister E and Nathan Ellery are the same guy. I mean, and we only like I don't know, we only know that as in he looks just like the guy. So I mean, I mean it's it's it's, it's not obvious, hidden from but... the audience. It's only hidden from the characters. Yeah. So basically, uh, Batman goes to the dock and is punching some people trying to figure out about Mister E and stuff, right? Yeah, because uh, he captured uh, Matt Cable and Abby. Um, he captured them in the last issue, so they're strapped up to an electric torture chair or something. Yeah. Well, that's... Anyways, I don't know. So yeah, uh, Mr. Gordon sends up the bat signal, and Batman goes there. Mr. E is now torturing. <laughs> He's got another German scientist here for some reason. Ach, yes. er, e. What a pleasure. Surprised to see you. If you it, want an evil scientist, you have to use a German. That's just the rule. I guess so. But, uh, yeah, they've got them strapped to electric chairs to talk, and then, uh, they won't talk, and then Commissioner Gordon tells him that they found, uh, that there's some weird swamp monster on the loose in the city, and that people are gonna panic, so he needs Batman to go deal with it before people see it. You mentioned, you mentioned it in the last episode. You, um, you were like, why are his teeth so human? Why did you never mention his eyes? What do you think his eyes are? Well, I mean, they at least are, like, they're, like, red with yellow pupils, so it's like they don't look Iris. all that... Irises, sure. Yeah, yellow irises. They look... Actually, you know, that, that's something that's funny. Is if, They use what the phrase, comic? roomy red eyes, more times in this comic than you would think. Wait, do they? Yeah, they do. It's just one of those things where they just talk about his roomy red eyes. It's like the, you know, the narrator panels, I guess, is what you could call them. But, you know, I should, I should really emphasize, because it's a gothic horror comic in the 70s, the, if you want an idea of what the narration and the kind of way that people speak at this point, it's very, like, Twilight Zone. It's very like, overdone. That's the way oh, yeah, here we go. Well, uh, this, like, just imagine... Here, I'll, I'll go back to the, I'm going well, here, I got to a the perfect, last... I got a perfect what? example right here. It's the, the panel where they're electrocuting Matt Cable to get him to talk. <coughs> Excuse me. I had to sneeze. <laughs> from the unpleasant scene and focus instead upon a certain office in the heart of Gotham City. Yeah, there you go. When a man dressed like a bat talks to a mustoid commissioner. They have a little caricature of Rod Serling and everything. That part I made up, but it would not be out of place if they did. For the ring of torn and twisted mechanical bodies that presses inexorably in upon the four terrified henchmen is a circle born of the burning need for vengeance. And though the vengeance is not so much sought of hatred for the gunmen, as it is love for the old man they had slain. Its res result is horribly, pitiably, 
the same. But That's all right. things are possible in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> all except for that last part are from the Clockwork Horror, the last issue that we read. So, uh... No, the Twilight Zone, that's in there. Oh, that was a Twilight Oh, okay, sure. Totally in there. I mean, you've almost got me looking back to double check, but... You know it's not in there. I know it's not, yeah. It's, it's just, totally it's... in there. It Anyways, may as well be. <laughs> it may as well be. So yeah, let's see. It's uh... bad, it's fun. It's a good time. So yeah, what happens next in Gotham? So basically, Swamp Thing now is looking for the Conclave to save his friends. He goes into some shady pub and starts bashing heads to get information. Uh, we get a bit of a montage of him. Going well, I, from... He doesn't start the, he No, he doesn't try to get information. He's just there, and then this douchebag bumps into him and knocks his hat off. And then he's like, it's a swamp guy. I'm gonna, I've am gonna, i got to beat him up. And then he's like, oh no. All right. All right, his plan is just to go there and sit and listen. Mm-hmm. To see if he can hear anything about the Conclave. And what's funny is that plan actually works. While he's sitting there, some guy at the next table starts talking about a smuggling operation with uh, the Conclave. And the, uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, he steals the paper that has the address on it. And that's when the guy gets angry and knocks his hat off. And that's when Swamp Thing starts busting heads. And then we get our montage of him uh, going Being around. Batman. And yeah he, yeah, he follows. Yeah, he, he's a better Batman than Batman in this issue. Because Batman well, basically just goes out and like... Basically, all he knows is that there's some big green swamp guy with a dog following him. So Batman goes out, the first dog he sees, and he's like, that's the dog. I'm going to chase it Well, I mean, endlessly. it is the dog, though, so I mean... I mean, he's right, but why he's, would... It, why? He's following it so he can find Swamp Thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, it ended up working, but if you think about it like a logical human... No, I don't you, know. Ha- you can't think about it. You have to think about it as in Batman logic. Batman has the ability to just make deductions that, based on very little evidence, and then figure everything out in a way that totally makes sense because wow. he's Batman. Yeah, well, anyways, while Batman, does. while Batman is chasing a dog, the Swamp Thing is off figuring out where the Conclave actually is. Yeah, he, he finds he, the warehouse. He breaks into it. He saves Matt and Abigail. Yep. The German he scientist him, calls for German backup. Scientist calls him up, and then uh, he re- meets up with Swamp Thing. But he's under the impression that this is just like a normal dude, basically. But he doesn't realize that he's made of plants and essentially invincible. So he be- he hits him a little bit. But then Swamp Thing's like trying to avoid fighting him because he's like, I don't want to hurt him. And he's like, well, he's still attacking me. Grabs his, grabs his fist and immediately knocks him out in one punch. Yeah, because Swamp ultimately, <laughs> Swamp Thing is not a character that Batman can beat. Yeah, so I will say, I, I will stand by, Bat- they make Batman look completely incompetent in this comic. I don't think they made him look incompetent. I think it's just more an idea of, like, look, this Swamp Thing is just too strong for Batman. I know, but it kind of comes across as him. It just makes Batman look bad, you know? He spends the whole issue chasing a dog, coincidentally ends up in the right place, and then gets murked by the Swamp Man in one hit. And while I'm not saying it's, like, unfitting, it does make him look bad. No, it's fu- It's funny. He later, he meets the Swamp Thing again in a later issue, and this time he brought preparations <laughs> That, like, would have worked on the Swamp Thing in this issue, but not the Swamp Thing in a later issue, so he still doesn't isn't able to beat him. Well, that's a hell of a teaser. So anyways, yeah. uh... Well, look, no one can beat the Swamp Thing. Wink, wink. Yeah. Well, uh, the Swamp Thing goes off uh, to scale the building. He literally climbs the building. Batman picks a lock and goes up the stairs like a civilized human. And uh, yeah. they both end up in the penthouse where Mr. E is. Uh, yeah. There's a bit of a scuffle. Uh, Mr. The dog... E is... Uh... By and the way, Mr. E he, tragically shoots the dog. And yeah, kills him. which which is the only thing he had left. For... He just Linda. cut out there. Oh. Boom. Yeah, the only what? thing he had left from Linda. From when he went sorry from Linda, and when he was still Alec Holland and not Swamp Man. <laughs> yeah, which you know that's not even really the emotional reaction he has to it. It's more just he literally just says, "This pig murdered my wife, tortured my friend, and shot down a defenseless dog." So it's like to him, the dog was just a dog. He didn't even make that level yeah. of emotional connection to it, but it still made like, him mad enough that he like went after the guy, grabs him, he's about to kill him, but then he says, no, I can't kill him, and he just pushes him away. Mr. Yeah. E then steps on his pet monkey's the monkey, hand. The monkey turns out to have been important, and he falls off the building, and and now he's dead. Well, you skipped a bit of a step there, yeah. Basically, the Swamp Thing just shoves the man back. He's like, no, I won't kill him. I won't be the monster that this guy is. And then the guy steps on the monkey's hand. While he's stumbling backwards, the monkey gets angry and bites him and knocks him off a building, and they both fall, presumably, to their death. Yep, everyone wins. Swamp Thing's not a killer, and the, the Mr. E is dead. But quote, uh, he in, was the villain, yeah. so now what? Yeah, or is he? Well, yeah. I mean, he was for the first couple of issues. He's the starter villain. Yeah, well, uh, 
But yeah, that's where that ends. Swamp Thing disappears again. Matt Kale and Abigail, I guess, go back to doing whatever they do. Batman goes back to being Batman, so. Yeah, and then Batman's like, well, well I'm, I'm guessing he probably finished whatever he came here. Um, yeah. So, uh, issue eight, The Lurker in Tunnel 13. This one, who boy. Yep. The other ones were gothic horror. This one this is, is cosmic horror. It's Lovecraftian. So, yeah, it's cosmic horror. So, yeah, let's just... Yeah, so uh, the, it all starts off with Swamp Thing in the cold. So it, they kind of hint here that cold may be Swamp Thing's weakness because plants, their metabolism slows in when they reach freezing point. And so, yeah. ba- so Swamp Thing is moving incredibly slow. Very slow. And uh, he stumbles upon a cave where he hears screaming. He goes into the screaming, into the cave, and finds an old man being attacked by a bear. He fights yep. the bear and then snaps the bear's neck. Well, the bear was in the middle of trying to kill him, so... Well, I mean, I'm not saying he was unjustified. It was just, it was brutal. He, like, grabs him by the face and, like, pushes his head until his neck snaps and yep. kills him. And, and then, then the, the old, uh... Then, then the, the old, old man, man does the thing that all old men in these stories do, where they're like, don't go there, it's Yeah, evil. he exposits himself to death. <laughs> okay, no, it was actually the bear claws in his chest that probably killed him. But yeah. he exposits all the way to his last breath. Tells him all Here's, about this town called yeah. Perdition. It's an old mining town. a normal town where they mined coal, but then they ran out of coal. And it's like, well, we're out of coal, and now our whole industry's dry up. So yeah, this guy's dad is like, I've got it. I'll look up spells and invocations. Because that's the natural, you know, instead of just, you know, picking up a new also industry or t- mining for a new thing. That's literally the title of the book in this one panel. <laughs> On page six. Spells and invocations. And he uh, he gathered up all of his mystic books and went into a cave, and then uh, weird th- people are disappearing. And yeah, they, well, they, out they say that uh, he he went into the tunnel and they heard him scream and then was never seen again. And people started disappearing when they get too close to the mines. Uh, basically, yeah. Swamp Thing. Yeah, then the old man dies. The Swamp Thing's like, well, you know, he's dead. He told me to stay away from perdition, but I can't just leave this old man here. I gotta take his body back to his town so his family can like you know, bury him properly because he's just a good dude like that. So yeah. he carries him back to perdition, and of course Naturally, the, the pitchforks. <laughs> immediately assume oh, he must have killed him, let's attack him with farm tools. Yeah, cue the pitchforks but to the, the townsfolk's credit like, I think they're uh, the ones that figure it out quick enough that he's, like, they're probably the townsfolk to figure it out the quickest that he's not a threat. You know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so they kind of, uh, he fights a few of them, and then, like, some like I guess uh, I think it was the, the the old man's son actually shows up. And he's like, "Look, he's got bear claws. Yeah, Obviously, like, the monster didn't kill him." Yeah, that swamp thing doesn't have bear claws. It must have been a bear that killed him. Yeah. So uh, and then, uh, they uh, they nurse him back to health, and it's like we haven't had any visitors. And then there's interspersed with panels of a weird looking eyeball. Yeah, which uh, seriously, until like. I just seriously thought that was supposed to be the old man's eyeball that they were showing, like his body was like coming back to life or something. I guess that's not what they were going for, but that sure is what it looked like. Um, but yeah, basically, the town, uh, this town is given off st- standard weird town vibes. Yes, it's got some stock vague adults. <laughs> <don't eat> <laughs> Love those. Yeah. Um, go into the cave. Turns out there's a giant flesh monster thing. It's an eldritch being named Ngala. Well, you skipped a few steps. So what happens is they they keep showing the eyeball opening, and then the kid, the the, uh, the man's okay. So not the old the old man's son has a son. That son suddenly wanders off, goes down into the tunnel thirteen, which you know it's a cursed one. You're not supposed to go into. Uh, Swamp things like well, they they get together the angry mob again, grab the torches, and they head to the tunnel. And they're like, we gotta go in there and save my son. And Swamp Thing's like, no, I'll go, because I'm the superhero. And uh, he goes down into the tunnel, and then cue the big flesh monster named uh, Managala. Did I spell that? Did I, did I pronounce that right? I thought it was Nagala. Mm, yeah. Uh, or Nagala. Managala. Managala. You know, it's probably Managala. Managala. It's probably Managala. Managala. Yeah, so it's that, M- would, that would fit in with the other, like, Nyarlathotep. Yeah, and C- Cthulhu, I don't know. Uh, Cthulhu's it's, uh, not even that important. Yeah, he, apparently he's like actually a, he's basically a side character in the Lovecraftian books. He, he is books. just one of many monsters, and he's not even a monster. It's Nyarlathotep is more important. Yeah, but Shub Cthulhu's Pigoreth. easier to pronounce. <laughs> well, I mean, it's really it's it should it's like Sh- yeah. I think I think what's the one Sh- Shiagorath? Shiagorath. 
Is that how you pronounce Shub Niggerith? I don't know. We're probably. I don't. That's the problem with Lovecraftian words is you could look at them and just like come up with two or three completely different pronunciations that would all technically be correct. Well, no, only one of them's correct, but there's no guide. <laughs> yeah. See, no one's here to tell us. Anyways, and, it's, uh, a, it's a standard cosmic horror. Turns out the dude summoned it to. It, uh, it ended up summoning it. He didn't mean to. And then I don't think like, he meant to. The world, well, probably not. But yeah, the thing supposedly it came from space or something, and then like his spell made it conjure as like a growth on the on the man's arm, and then he pro gradually grew into the enormous mass, and the uh, the entire universe is about to reach some level of equilibrium or something that will allow Managala to uh, basically take over the yeah. universe. Also, he That's just casually cool. drops that he Managala is the one who decreed the birth of life on your world, to quote the comic. So he basically created life on Earth. He gave man yeah, that's, that's the propensity the for thing. violence. Here's this the creature is basically just God. Does this ever come back up in the DC universe at all? You know, um, well, here's the thing. The DC universe is full of different conflicting... <laughs> basically, it's kind of hard to talk about because in an attempt to not alienate anybody, they've kind of just taken a generalized approach where they take various elements of all the various religions and mythologies and just kind of put them together in one giant cosmology. So in a sense, every religion is true, but also they all have conflicting creation stories, if you think about it too much. And then the afterlife has a bunch of different things. It's different for every planet. They explain how that works in a later Swamp Thing issue and, an invasion, and in the Invasion comic from the 80s. Um... But like you know, surprisingly enough, M N N N the, this this thing does show up in Challenges of the Unknown eighty one through eighty seven, which also has Swamp Thing and came out in between the original series and the new series. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Anyways, he fights it, and then he caves in the tunnel. Yeah, he, uh, the, the tunnel caves in. Um, oh, yeah, and I, I guess uh, what I, we forgot to mention, Managala, his whole goal was to acquire mass, as in, like, he needed biological mass to make himself bigger. So, like, they show that he, like, consumed a bunch of rats. All the humans that disappeared were basically, yeah. uh, you know, some dat mass that he wanted. It was all about dat mass. And, um, and then he basically right. just straight up says that Swamp Thing is the last mass he needs. If he consumes Swamp Thing, he will officially have the mass he needs to reach his, uh, what's it, what's he called? His, his full mass. Yeah, he needs to, uh, <laughs> he needs to reach his full mass before this planetary alignment happens, or he'll miss his window to take over the universe. But Swamp Thing fights him, and then, like, Monogla gets angry and, like, collapses the cave around him by mistake, and that kills him. Yeah. Swamp Thing emerges from the cave, the townsfolk are all there, and they're like, they must both be dead, and then Swamp Thing comes back, and they're like, no, he is still, like, Swamp Thing's still alive, oh no, he's gonna get revenge, and then Swamp Thing's like, uh, no, I won't kill you, it's like, it's over now, like, you guys are jerks, and but I'm not gonna out. kill you, but then it turns out that the guy's son now has a growth on his arm too, so... Yeah, it's cosmic horror. You never win in cosmic. Horror. Yeah, this literally, this the last panel is literally has the end question mark. So the end question mark. And I honestly think it's a fifty-fifty whether or not that'll actually ever come back up again. It never comes back up in Swamp Thing comics, but it does come up in the weird uh, in between Challenges of the Unknown, which I have. <laughs> All right, then. and uh... it does come up there. See, okay, here's the thing about Swamp Thing. It goes through a lot of different genres. It starts out as gothic horror, and then it kind of turns into like like sci-fi, like pulp sci-fi, and then it turns into like um like a globe-trotting comic. Then it starts shifting back into regular horror, and then it stays as regular horror for a large portion of the Alan Moore run. And then it kind of and then Rick Veitch kind of lightens the tone a little bit, and then it kind of turns into an adventure comic for a bit, and then it kind of goes back to horror, but like with more so, but like with more of a social commentary bent and like more of a real horror sort of thing and then i don't even know what the last section is i guess epic huh. but it's it's strange yeah and then it and goes I, back to horror again later <laughs> anyways i just want to take a minute to say uh star wars rogue one was just all right uh, what <laughs> all right welcome back from the commercial break uh <laughs> okay <then. laughs> um yeah buy lots of that product whatever it was what product <laughs> Star Wars Rogue One? Uh, no, that one was just all right. I, you know, I'm fine with Star Wars Rogue One. Yeah, we'll we'll have a very in depth podcast about that one day, I'm sure, because I think we have very differing opinions on it. On Rogue One or Solo? Uh, probably, maybe both. I don't know. We've never really talked about Solo, but Rogue One. Uh, I know you loved it, or at least liked it. 
I thought uh, it was just I all right. Liked it. The first 45 minutes are very rushed. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just all right. It's basically like, all right, here's a character, here's another character, here's another character. All right, now. The well, it's basically just like, hey, you know this guy. Hey, you know this thing. Hey, look at this thing. You remember this. All right, and Death then, Star. Yeah, then Death Star, boom. Yeah, the uh, the final, the whole final act is pretty cool, though. You know, it's like, yeah. put the war in Star Wars, if you know what I mean. Uh, no, Clone Wars put the war in Star Wars. Well, Best they can Star both do Wars. it. I don't know. All right. Well, I guess, you know, how, hey, what's our time at? Uh, 35.30. 35.30. Okay, so no. Or 35.40. Five more issues to get through. Yeah, we got this. We got this. We got, we got this. Anyways. Yeah, so, uh, issue number nine, the Stalker from Beyond. Yeah, it starts with him on a train. Uh, he's sleeping he's under a, train, a, sleeping under a tarp. Home. Some other homeless people on the train are like, we're going to we're gonna rob you. And then they find out it's a swamp thing. And they're like, well. <laughs> and then yep, he and throws well, him off the train. Well, we've done and then, goofed. And yeah, he throws him off the train. And then make but, sure oh, to ass- make sure to assure the audience that they survived the fall and that he did not just kill somebody. Well, yeah. I mean, the, I mean getting thrown off a train probably wouldn't kill you if it's with the, with a hill like this. Tra- yeah, and trains You just get very move. injured. <laughs> At least this kind of train does not actually move that fast. Yeah, so you, no, you, you, you just have a lot of bruises and maybe some broken ones. Yeah, so they'll be fine. But yeah, he, he finds a swamp. He but turns then, uh, out he's back in the Louisiana swamp. Meanwhile, yeah, yeah. in Florida, Al- uh, at Matt Cable and Abby Arcane, they're hanging out on a beach, which, by the way, they're on a beach, but um, it's, like, cold and rainy looking. I mean, you've <laughs> obviously never been to a beach if you think that's out of place. It's cold and rainy look. It like it's not even sunny. Like the sky is overcast it's, by the looks of it. Yeah, we see it's symbolic for Matt Cable's gray heart, as they straight up say. <laughs> the heart of Matthew Cable this day is grayer and bleaker than all of nature is wonder. I, I just butchered yep. that, but yeah. They're uh, hanging but, out on the beach in their swimsuits because, um, well, you know, they're just trying to relax. Trying but, to relax, uh, he's still but thinking about Swamp Thing, and he's like, I gotta get him. Well, because now he's starting to think, I think this is when he's starting to, yeah, no, he, he's starting to realize that maybe I'm being blind, you know, maybe Swamp Thing isn't actually so bad. He saved us, like, what, three times now? Four times? Yeah, but then it uh, turns yeah. out that the uh, Washington, D.C. sends a guy named Smithers to uh, g- take him out of his vacation, which pisses hit Cable off, rightfully so. And then he's like, uh, we're going to have, we're going to do some military stuff. Yeah, we need you for this military operation, but uh, it just so happens operation to be. space fake. Yeah, it happens. It just so it just so happens to be right in the middle of that swamp where the swamp thing started off, and he just coincidentally happens to have just fallen off a train and landed there too. So, uh, well, it's not coincidence. It's just the foundation of the story. Yeah, I mean, it is a coincidence that all this yeah, would happen. Yeah, but every once. story, every story is a coincidence. The only reason any story is worth telling is because something weird happened. Well, it doesn't always have to be straight up coincidence, though. I'm no, not no, complaining. They, I'm just saying that it, it is kind like of like literally funny everything is coincidence. Like your entire life is coincidence. It's like what if your parents just hadn't happened to meet up wherever they met up, decided to go on a date or whatever, then you wouldn't exist. Yeah, but that'd be like that's like different cases here. Yeah, well, because it's like you. It only looks like a coincidence in retrospect when you see the result. But while it was happening, it's just life. Like, that's just things happening. Yeah, but for them to just co- just end up stumbling into the same place at the same time this many times is a little little over, or a little well, far-fetched, like, but it's a common any, book, it's fine. Any one individual thing is always a coincidence, but it's only when you know the result. You know that the end result is that you, is your life, and so it's like, what are the chances that everything could have lined up perfectly to, cr- to allow me to exist? But at the same time, it's like, no, things just happened, and then you were the, the end result of that. You're looking at it backwards. It's in this with a story... Things have to happen or else the story doesn't happen. And if the story doesn't happen, then you wouldn't even be able to have the observation that things are happening weirdly. No point in telling a boring story. Well, we don't really need to get into the philosophical uh, connotations of uh, coincidence right now. But we will one day. Sure. <laughs> Anyways, let's... For a future episode because we love teasing future episodes for some reason. Well... Anyways, uh, let's get into the comic, though. So basically, uh, Matt Cable gets taken by Smithers back to meet Captain Brad Sampson at the, what what do they call this place? The, the Agency of Inter- Interstellar Discovery, which they very they very organically work into the dialogue. Oh, but it does, pal. It does. Seems like AID, the Agency of Interstellar Discovery, has finally earned its keep. He says that to Matt Cable, which is someone that presumably knows what AID stands for. I don't know. I mean, he's a, they don't necessarily know each other in the government. 
Well, I love that they have that weird kind of forced in line to explain what AID means, but then they take an aside, yeah. like down here, you swatted one boy, and honest to God, UFO, and then they put a little asterisk, and a box at the bottom of the panel says, UFO stands for Unidentified Flying Object. <laughs> so it's like yeah. they took that little aside to explain an acronym that pretty much everyone already knows, but they had yeah. to hand fist the dialogue to explain what AID stands for. I don't know, it's, it's sort of like an Usagi, like... Because every now and then he, th S S Stan Sakai, Sa Saki, I've never known how to pronounce his last name, Probably but he, he throws in re like actual um, like Japanese words and he'll use, and then he'll put a little thing at the end, the bottom of the page to translate it. But like the one word, he doesn't always do this, but like the, the uh, with, with one word, the word Ronin, which has been explained over and over, every time it comes up, he explains what that word means. And it's like, do you really need to... Who's still reading this at this point? I don't think you need to keep translating it. I think we all know what it means now. They you keep they keep saying it. Yeah. But anyways, so anyways uh, thing he finds a barn, alien spaceships inside. Well, you skip the part like, where basically uh, the uh, AID. Yeah, we skipped over how Agent Samson basically tells Cable uh, we found a UFO and it just so happens to be in the Louisiana swamplands. So we're uh, we're going there and we're taking you with us because you've already dealt with some stuff down there. Meaning, you know, like yeah. basically they had the whole Alec and Linda Holland incident down there. So they're taking him just to make sure. I, I don't know. You know, it's just because they needed him in the plot. That's why they're taking him. But yeah, then we cut the swamp thing, stumbling back to, you know, the barn where it all yeah. started, where the lab was. And he thinks, well, maybe, you know, some of my old materials are still there. Maybe I can figure out how to make a cure for my condition and become human again. So he yeah. breaks the lock, goes inside, and what does he find? It's an alien spaceship that looks alien like spaceship. a jet, but also his components, his his computer components and such were used to help repair the ship. And then we get a look at the alien, which um, just looks adorable. like... adorable. He's just adorable. Well, I, okay, so it's like, it looks, I don't know what, it's got a green face with with big pink eyes and strilly things, so kind of like a bug, and it's in an orange suit. He's got like big old honking elephant legs. They even yeah, call it that in the comic. Yeah, and this is the one where he gets his he gets his hand lasered off, and it immediately grows back so that he can grab the gun and break it. Yeah, because he's figuring out his, his he's figuring out he's well he because he since he discovered he can regrow things he can probably like make it do faster now. I don't know, and and he only got his hand cut off this time instead of his entire arm. So I mean there are excuses for it, but anyways, uh, basically the aliens just standing there checking him out. He's checking it out, and then he gets angry because it's like this thing destroyed my lab and possibly my only chance of becoming human. And then he just gets angry and kind of out of character, lashes out at the alien. I don't know, yeah. it's kind, kind yeah, of out of character bad. for him. Alien I think. fights back. The alien lasers his hand off, he breaks the gun, he grabs the alien by the helmet, and then the alien just freaking karate kicks him with his elephant leg. <laughs> and basically kills Swamp Thing. Which, that's yeah. another one. If Swamp Thing can regenerate, why can he be knocked unconscious, slash, like, nearly killed? Well, you know, I could explain that, but I feel like I'd have to spoil some things. Okay, well, I'll just trust that it'll be explained later. But yeah, basically he gets completely murked by this alien. Knocked unconscious, almost dead. The alien I mean, looks the all sad. The alien's bigger than he is. Well, I mean, yeah, but still, Swamp Thing's taken a lot worse than a kick to the chest. Like, you know, a bullet, or a few hundred bullets by now. But the alien, you know, picks him up. He feels all sad. He's like, oh, no, look what I, look what he made me do. Look what they did to him. They massacred my boy. And he takes the Swamp Thing out to the swamp, throws him into the water, because somehow he just knows, like, you know, this thing looks like he belongs here. You know, yeah, good intuitive like, guess. This is probably, this is probably right. That's probably right. And he throws and him into the, the water. Dudes, the dudes show up later, and they find the alien. Yeah, then yeah, the really military dudes back. show up. One dude tries to attack him. It punches him back, and then it doesn't do anything else. And they're like, well, I'm going to... He puts it in handcuffs, and then they tie it to a tree by the looks of it. Well, I mean, he does kill the one guy he punches, because this alien apparently is just like a martial arts god. <laughs> no, he, th no, he didn't kill him. I think he did. No, they say it right here. O'Reilly's just dazed. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, but look at the alien. It's not moving, as almost as if it regrets what it's done. Yeah, see, the yeah. alien's very, like, depressed for, you know, it's like, every time he hurts somebody, he just gets sad, and it makes me feel really bad for the alien. Yeah. It's Which, I mean, I'm sure is the point. Yeah, I'm sure that's the point, but, yeah, the alien uh, ends up knocking the guy out. They put him in handcuffs. That They just so happen to have handcuffs, the perfect size for this alien, even though presumably know. they hadn't seen him before this. They're um, magic handcuffs. And he's chained to the tree, and then yeah, and they're just the like, they're doing their things, and they're like, they're, we gotta kill this alien, and it's like, well, they argue about it for a bit. Yeah, they're arguing about whether they should kill it or whether they should carry out their orders of taking it back alive, 
And, they're and then like, one well, guy, it's her guy, but it just, you know, one guy fakes sleeping and then is just about to just straight up execute the alien while everyone else is asleep. Swamp Thing stops him. Everybody else wakes up, sees what he's doing, and then the, and then Cable's like, "What? You were trying to shoot the alien?" And so he attacks him, and then this guy tries yeah. to shoot him. All hell breaks. Everyone, this. everyone breaks out in a fight. Swamp Thing helps the alien, traps him in a force bubble, force field bubble, and then he he's finally uses communication. And then he turns out he's just here. He basically just has the equivalent of like crashing a plane on an island. Well, you, and, you kind of skipped over a little bit there. I mean, like the alien basically. Well, first of all, no, I the, was explaining it. He's doing this the standard alien thing of well, it turns out humanity is garbage. You guys suck. You're all violent. Yeah, but I mean, well, first of all, you skipped over the fact that well, yeah, put, being in the water, of course, revived Swamp Thing. So that's how he was able to come back and help the alien. And then this alien basically says that he's heard enough of their language that now he can like speak their language somehow uh, i'm just going to talk it up to universal translator or something yeah well he basically traps them all in a bubble and then gets into a spaceship and blasts off and then just crashes and burns right yep he flies off exploding the barn in the flies process off, but then the ship it turns out it wasn't good malfunctions it crashes and then, and then swamp thing is sad about it as yes, it they, is. they don't really explain why the ship crashed necessarily i mean i guess it just wasn't fully repaired yet which I mean, big yeah. oof. I guess Look, I don't know. Yeah, Long story I mean, we, for, get, yeah. we get the Alien point dies. hammered home that people are garbage. Yes, yeah, so, I mean if they really wanted to hammer home, they should have just had the military dude shoot the plane down or something. But I don't know. He uh, crashes and burns though. Poor alien is now dead. I think probably. It's one of those things. It's like I don't know. And then here it comes, issue ten. The man this who would not die. Yes, this is an important issue in the series and will become more important later. And this it's also just, the final oh issue that Bernie Wrightson drew. This, this is his last issue on art duties. Dang. Like for everything or just for Swamp Thing in general? Uh, so I, don't, I mean, I don't know how much he did. I could go find out. But this is the last issue of Swamp Thing that he draws. Huh. And, the, and thus the original team is ended after this issue. Len Wein does come back though. He's the he's the editor of the second series for. A while. Yeah. So, anyways, um. But yeah, in this issue. So yeah, how's it start? So, well, oh, yeah. there's a fugitive who's yeah, well, in the woods. Well, you, you comes across an old woman. You can't what? skip over this. What's the what's the fugitive's name? Oh right. Hunk um, Dory. <laughs> well, Hunk is in quotes. Yeah, but that's his nickname, Hunk Dory. So it, hunk, he's Hunky Dory. Oh, I just never mind. I just you never got that. For a I just <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I might he's have gotten Dory. it a while ago. I, hey, what's the name so, of the old woman? Well, it depends on which version you're reading. Which version? What did they like? Oh, did they sanitize it for later? Uh, um, hold on, I can, I can find out. Well, because in the version I read, her name is Antebellum, which is just right on the nose. <laughs> wait, wait, what's wrong with Antebellum? Well, anti, you know, Antebellum it refer, it, it means. It refers to the period of time before slavery was ended. Oh. And uh, she's the, you know, the... Uh, I mean, I'm just used to seeing Bellum as a name, so... Yeah, but Antebellum, I mean, that's a little on the nose. I mean, it's very on the nose. It's, like, right across the freaking nose. But, you'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get into why that's I'll so find, on the nose. I'll but, find, yeah, she's... I gotta, uh, find, I gotta find the article. There's an article that has the original picture of the original panel. Because, like, she has a name in reprints that's well, different... I mean, I mean, later in this names. comic, they reveal what her real name is. It was like El Elsbeth, I think. Uh, it's like Elizabeth uh, was shorter, but I mean, but yeah, I wouldn't uh, be surprised if they changed that in the reprints because you know. Hold on, I gotta. I can find it. I can if I could just use the search function. Swamp thing. Should I just keep going on the uh, summary while you do that? Yeah, you know, you you keep going. Yeah, so basically, Hunk Dory uh, comes after Antebellum. And uh, yeah. wraps his handcuff. He's got handcuffs on. He wraps them around her neck. He's about to kill her. And Swamp Thing shows up. It's like I ain't having that. And then the man just like tries to fight Swamp Thing, but then just dies apparently because they didn't show it, but he was full of bullets because I guess he had been shot during his escape or something. Anyways, uh, he dies, and she just tells him, you know, it's like don't worry about it. Uh, he's he's dead. No one could take right, that I many bullets it. except you. Oh, you did. And the, yes, Antebellum. In the original comic, her name was Antediluvian. I wonder why they changed that. And they changed it to Antebellum in all reprints. And there's no explanation for Wait, does, Del Ante does Diluvian mean something? I have no idea. Well, I'm going to find out. Antediluvian. Right. Okay, I'll continue. You find out if that means something. Anyways, 
So they're doing that. He's oh, dead. yeah. Oh, wait, it is a word. Yeah, antediluvian of or belonging to the time before the biblical flood. That, okay. So I guess they just, oh, I get it before the flood. Anyways, That's what it means. So, so this issue is a uh, very, this is take more of a set. It's an old slave plantation where it's some douchebag in a cowboy hat because that's what all slavers look like apparently. He's got mutton chops too. Anyways, he's the he's he had slaves. At one point um he drew he drew and quartered someone basically. Well, he well, and then, he, so the other slaves. You're just skipping uh, over some some significant stuff here. I you mean, know, I don't understand you. You were earlier in the other episode, you're like, "We don't need to go over the details of everything." Well, now I'm committed. Well, now, now I'm committed. Well, it's because we're trying to do highlights. You're like, ah, we got to talk about it. panel five on page six. Well, no, because uh, you, you see, I'm, I would be okay with just doing like a quick recap of each one. But since we're doing this more in-depth dive, like you're skipping over big things. Like the fact that he didn't just draw and quarter someone. He fell in love with one of the slaves, but she didn't like him. And that slave just happened to be named Elsbeth, which I mean, they reveal at the end of the comic was actually the name of Antebellum. So basically he fell in love with Antebellum, but then well, she, she didn't like him. I haven't there yet. I, you're interrupting my flow of explanation. Oh, well, I'm sorry. But I mean... Okay, but first of all, why is she even telling him any of this anyways? Like, this didn't really come up naturally. Um, she kind of just spiraled off into this tale. I don't know, probably because there was another person there, and it's like, here's an excuse to tell my story. Some people are like that. They just wait until they have someone to talk to. Yeah, I guess it just kind of started as, this place used to be nice, you yeah. know, and uh, here's why. And then she just starts talking about the slave plantation and the guy that wanted to draw and quarter her. Yeah, but luckily a guy, another guy, for some reason, who's black, whose name is Black Jubal, but he's also a black guy. I don't know why he's called Black Jubal, but he has one arm. He goes up to st uh, to stand up to him, but the slaver's like, well, I don't like that, and so he burns him. And then, um, yeah. yeah, he basically he gives a dying curse. He's like, I, I will revenge this. And then, you know, he goes around continuing to be sadistic. By the way, it's like I get that they're trying to portray slavery as evil, but, like, the, the, the degree to which this guy is evil goes to the point that it's just impractical because it's like he's basically just killing all of his slaves, and it's like, okay, dude, I get that, like, you're a douchebag, but if you kill your slaves, you don't have a workforce, and it kind of defeats the point of all of even having slaves well, in the I mean, first place. I mean, that's the point is that he's not just, you know, it's not just that slavery is evil. This guy is, like, extra evil. Yeah, he has slaves, and he's just uh, yeah, and he's just he's, no he's evil, and so he's extra evil because he's an evil slaver. Yeah, but then they heard screams, and it turns out he'd been torn limb from limb, like he tried to do to El. Yeah, but you um, know, and she's just stuck around because I don't know, she just likes being alone. Well, but I then, mean, well, they'll reveal at the end, but yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, but then she sees something, and he sees something in the darkness. Weird, gangly things. What do these look like? The unmen, and he, and then it turns out. Yeah, he falls Anton him back, Arcane and is back alive. Well, kind and of. Now he, he looks, looks like a horrific monster man. He looks like someone put took Gollum from Lord of the Rings, put him into Photoshop, and just stretched him. Yeah, basically, he's really tall now, disproportionately muscular, has a weird like he's mi missing pieces of his face. One of his, his arms is really long. Arms. Yeah, he's incredibly disproportionate, but he's back to life. He's also naked. Well, yeah, but that doesn't ever factor in. And one of his eyes is missing. I think so. Yeah, I think it's missing. Either it that is. or his eyelid is just, like, so deformed it covers it. Uh, he gets a, re a replacement eye in later issues. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, basically the... Uh, hey, you just spoiled something there. That's not a spoiler. <laughs> I mean, I it's kind of... It's a very light spoiler, but... It goes yeah. from being an empty socket in this issue to, like, a weird uh, mechanical... No I, mean, no, I mean, it's a spoiler that he's in later issues. I, I, I already told everyone that. Yeah, I mean, it's Just a light like, spoiler, but... Anton Arcane is Swamp Thing's nemesis. Yeah. Expect him to show up a few more times. Yeah. Well, anyways, the uh, the monsters all attack him, and they beat him up, and they're about to kill Swamp Thing. But then, uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah, and then Arcane explains it. Basically, uh, after he died, a few of his unmen were still left, so they brought his corpse back to the lab and, like, rebuilt him. But since they, uh... Since they kind of suck and didn't have his yeah. guidance, they put him back together wrong, and that's why he looks like an absolute yeah. monster now, I guess? Well, yeah. They turn him... Yeah. They weren't... They used the, his mad science techniques and all the extra body parts to build a new, bo a, a new body and repair it, but it ends up coming out as horrifically deformed because they don't... Because he wasn't there surgeons. to guide him. Yeah. Yep. And so now he looks like this. See, this is this is what I mean. We need like a separate website that can just have pictures. Because when I say now he looks like this, I can't really emphasize how horrific the guy looks now. Uh, it's like sloth from the Goonies, 
and Gollum from Lord of the Rings crossed, kind of. But on steroids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically he's very muscular. Um, but yeah, basically they uh, they get in an all-out fight, you know, uh, the, oh yeah, the yeah. Arcane's like, no, like, uh, you guys stay back, this is a mono e mono fight. If I can't beat him one-on-one, -on -one, I don't deserve to have his body, because that's still his motive, is he wants to steal Swamp Thing's body and have his immortality. Yeah, uh, that, that's his his goal. His one of the, but in the course of fighting, they ended up in a graveyard, and then spooky fog starts rolling in. Yeah, you cut out there again for a second, but I don't think and we missed anything important. And then spooky fog starts rolling in, and then he's about to beat Swamp Thing. He's got him on the ground. And he's like, "Yes, I'm gonna steal the body," but uh oh. Oh yeah, but fog in the graveyard. Well, remember what brings the fog though is uh, Arcane says a few things. He says a couple of trigger words. He says uh. Uh, rather, well, he see. he says, uh, I, th I think a man such as you would prefer to perish now rather than live on as a slave. And before that, yeah. he says, after all, I like, need that body's condition. I'm going to enslave humanity. Said, a world where he, all humanity wow. shall serve as my slaves, and I'll be master of the world. And it's like, uh-oh, a slavery guy? And so, guess oh, who no, comes yeah. out of the graveyard? The ghosts of all the former slaves who were killed. Yeah, led by Black Jubal. Yeah, the one-armed guy. Which, yeah, I guess you, you didn't really mention that. He's one-armed, and that's the reason they burned him at the stake, because apparently you can't draw and quarter somebody if they're missing an arm. Which, I mean, I guess that makes sense. But I mean, I guess. it'd be harder. It would be harder. But I, I don't know. It's just a weird little yeah. detail they threw in there. But yeah, that's why they burned him at the stake. But now he's back to repay his debt, and this guy, like... I don't know, does this guy, yeah. like, have his own comic book or something? Because he seems like... No. I mean, maybe it's just because no, I've... No, he's just here. Maybe it's just yeah, but they put him to sleep, but... and then while he's asleep... They uh they rip Arcane to pieces and then bury him. Yeah, well then yeah, when Swamp Thing finally comes to, there's like a bunch of gravestones. You know, I think exact number of gravestones for how many unmen there were. The one in the middle is taller and it has Arcane's name written on it. Yeah, there's and seven then, uh, gravestones. But the one in the middle is with the one that, and it just has Arcane like painted on. Yeah, and then uh, Swamp Thing wanders back into the swamp, comes back to where the cabin was, where the old woman was, and what does he find? He finds he a bush. But underneath that bush is another <laughs> gravestone, Elspeth Vellum. It turns out that the woman was a ghost also. And then and uh, at the end of the comic, you get a little, you get a little sneak weird peek. Worm things. Yeah, sneak peek of issue number eleven. Yeah. The Conqueror Worms. Yeah. Now this now one. We, we say goodbye to Bernie Wrightson, and now we say hello to a guest artist. For these, who who draws? Who's the artist on these issues? Uh, Nestor Redondo. Oh yeah, he does. He does the next few issues. Yeah, he does this one. Still only twenty cents. Yep, still only twenty cents. Yeah, that, that had to be nice. Um, anyways, oh, though, yeah. uh, so this one, how are we doing? Uh, fifty-seven, about fifty-eight minutes in. Do you think we can make it? All right, we can make it. Nestor Renal, Ren, Ren, oh wait, Redo, Redo, Redondo, or Redondo, I guess. Redondo, I guess. Nestor Redondo, he's Nestor the Redondo. now. Yeah. So, okay, here's the difference. The primary distance between, um. There are two styles. A lot less shadows. Uh, Bernie, Wrightson, Bernie Wrightson is a lot more linear and shadowier. He does darker art. This guy does not do as many shadows. Yeah, That's so you the know, I, I didn't even catch the difference in art in artists, but I totally noticed there was a subtle difference in the art style. So I mean, it's there. The difference? I mean, I, I could tell that I could tell that there was a difference. I just didn't realize it was a different artist. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyways, um, sorry. I have a slight cold oh yeah, right he's now. thinking about the uh, alien ship. Oh yeah, he's Blue remembering. Up. He's remembering that, and uh, yeah, and he he's. Finds, and he was standing in one place for too long, and then started rooting to the ground a little. And... Yeah, and he just glanced right over that. I'm sure that'll be important later, but yeah. Uh, then, and then yeah, he, he, he starts and... angsting again about like waxing eloquent about like how the horrible state that he's in, and then he gets mad, but and then he's like, "Man, how did this happen?" And then meanwhile, Cable and Abby are there. Yeah, I think they're they're here looking for Swamp Thing because now uh, Cable has finally resolved that he's not going to hunt Swamp Thing now. He just wants to find him because he wants to find out what happened to Alec Holland. He's yeah. given up his vendetta, but he still wants to find Swamp Thing because Swamp Thing's still the only real witness to what happened to Alec and Linda. Which so. he's still trying to avenge. Yeah, and uh, they get attacked by a big mutant crocodile with very human-looking hands. But it's not Killer Croc. No, it's just a mutated crocodile, because I guess they've kind of started However, to establish that... there is that... an issue of Batman where Swamp Thing and Batman... Where Swamp Thing summons Killer Croc and Batman meets him. 
Huh. They were try they were trying to resolve Killer Croc's character arc, but then you know DC was just like nah, and then they just brought him back anyways. Yeah, well, uh, I guess they're kind of starting to establish that there's something inherent about the swamp itself that causes things to mutate. I don't know if that's just because of the bio-restorative formula that got dumped in there, or if it's something about the swamp itself, but they're starting to show that creatures that live there get mutated. Want, so that's... You want to you, you know something? Uh, sure. It doesn't ever come back. <laughs> oh, good to know. Well, anyways, they, they start they, to hint at that. They basically hints at stuff that they never address after. Yeah, well, we'll just tell ourselves that they got created when the formula got spilled in the water or something. I don't know. Except that only worked on plants, so I guess that doesn't really work. Uh, anyways, yep. they fight the swamp. Yeah. They swamp thing shows up and fights the crocodile, and then he runs away because like he doesn't trust that they're not still trying to kill him. Which fair enough. But then they get grabbed by the big alien worm creatures with elephant trunks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That happens. Um, that's that's pretty much the best way to describe it. Imagine a giant purple worm thing, Very but then vain. when you get to the front of the worm. It has a face that looks like something out of Pogo with an elephant trunk and tusks. And, yeah, and tusks. Uh, but yeah, basically, um, it, it grabs <laughs> Abby. I love and this. Abby's in the typical "I'm being held held by a giant monster" pose. Yeah, and then uh, panel one on page old, eight is probably my favorite. Old movie posters like where a woman's being held by a giant monster. Say, it's that pose. You know yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah, and uh, page eight, uh, or yeah, page eight, panel one. One of my favorite. Like just drawings in this entire series. Him just straight up getting cat cable just straight up being punched in the face by this worm's elephant trunk. Like he straight, straight up balls it into a fist and just so, punches him in the well, face. I'm imagining more that like like you know like you know like the like you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you mean like what an elephant sounds thing. like? No oh, party, like party thing. Oh, like a uh, yeah, I know what you're talking you about. You blow into it and like the paper rolls out. Yeah, I'm imagining it's kind of like that. Yeah, he just got punched in the face <laughs> by one <laughs> with sound effect and all, probably. Um, yeah, well, the uh, the sound effect here is unf and thwud. Yeah, I think the thwud was it making contact, and the unf was cable saying unf. So uh, yeah, then it turns out the worms have psychic powers and shoot a uh, swamp thing with a psychic laser. Yeah, with a scat sound effect, a skazat. I don't know how to pronounce that, but he gets shot by that and he knocks him unconscious. And uh, what happens next? Abby and my cable wake up in some weird underground lair with uh. A bunch of other yeah. dudes. We uh, got Luke, the old man. Kane. Who is apparently Rick. a sheriff that got, like, shot by one of their mind rays and is now, like... We got we got Matt Cable, Abby Arcane. We got L Luke. We got... Yeah, anyways. I think this guy... What's the guy? I think Ruth the... Bolt. Bolt is the, the other man. There's the black woman who's Ruth, and then Bolt, I'm pretty sure, is the black guy. Yeah, he's the black he's man, the and he ends up actually becoming kind of a main character for at least the next few issues. But yeah, no, he shows up a few more times in the original series. Yeah, well, basically, uh, they explain that Kane tried to escape. He was a sheriff, but then the aliens shot him, and... Well, I guess just I better just read it how they quoted it. <laughs> how they said, Then Worm Things did something funny to his head, some kind of ray that... Anyways, uh, they, they're implying that they basically gave him a mental disability. I'm just trying to say that as gently as possible. But that's basically what the eight worms did to Kane. So that's kind of why they haven't tried to escape again. They scrambled his brain. Yeah, they scrambled. There you go. That. They scrambled his brain. That's what they did. And, um, and now he's clearly, like, doesn't have his mental facilities. Anymore. Yeah, so the alien, then the, the worms show up and uh, reveal they can talk and they tell them to come. And, and they bring him to a guy who looks like a dis like a discount high father. <laughs> yeah, which I guess apparently this guy is from a different comic. His name is Zachary Nail, and they have one of those little asterisks where they say like, as detailed and yeah, as detailed in Phantom Stranger number fourteen, Specter of the Stocking Swamp. So I guess that this is kind of almost a sequel to something that happened in a different comic entirely. I don't Did think you? I ever actually read that. Yeah, I'm surprised uh, you didn't, but I also don't blame maybe you. Maybe I did, but I just forgot. I don't know. Okay, it's, well, let's see. Uh, he but, builds he builds a swamp dome city because he's trying to Andrew Ryan himself into a, being a king. Well, he's trying to escape. He's like trying to like I guess recruit people so that he's trying to escape the pollution. I guess because he thinks the world's going to end from pollution, just like everybody else. And uh, he and builds a dome. Swamp, they go into the swamp, and then his swamp dome sunk, and then the chemicals got out and mutated a bunch of worms into weird things. But then they're oh, like, you "You're go. the leader." Oh, there you go. That's probably where the mutant crocodile came from. No, there is um there's another thing. I just I remember that there's like a bit that like they start setting up here, but then because of stuff that happens later, it gets re renders it completely meaningless and then they never do anything with it. Huh. Well, yeah, anyways, uh yeah, so the uh the 
yeah, the, the worms bring him there so that Zachary Nail can tell him all about this. Then uh, they tell him, go back to your room, I'll call you when I need you. And uh, Swamp Thing wakes up, goes into a cave, and finds the city. Uh, meanwhile, they're all making, like, the uh, cable. Here, and Matt, Matt Cable's like, ah, come on, guys, rally, we can escape, we gotta do it. Yeah, they say, let's dig up some weapons. So they move aside, like, a mattress and somehow find giant needles. I don't know, did that make any sense to you? Where did they get those? What, the giant needles? Yeah, are they saying they, like, took apart the bed frame and made those or something? But they straight up just look like big needles with, like, an eye hole, like a like a thread hole on the end and everything. I don't know. But, yeah, they, they find some giant needles. And, uh... Oh, wait, I'm looking through. I don't... Does it explain where this came from? Yeah, well, it's, it's in page 13. It shows Cable moving aside the mattress. Well, I think that's a mattress. And he says, now come on and help me dig up some weapons. We've got a busy night ahead of us. And it cuts the Swamp Thing, cuts back, and Matt Cable's playing dead, saying that the worms killed him to get their attention. They come in there, and then Matt Cable just straight up has a giant needle that he sticks into the worm's eye. Yeah, okay, page 15. This is where you can see the difference in art style. Swamp Thing's face, look at the last panel. It's much more monkey-ish. Yeah, see, it's a lot less shadowed. You can see a lot more details, and I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> Well, I'm mean, at this point, Swamp Thing is basically just drawn as like a green humanoid with roots on him. Yeah, but, uh, it's, he's he's not super detailed, so it's like it's just less shadows. Yeah, basically. Um, but yeah, then uh, Swamp and Thing this finds kind of high father over here. Yeah, he finds New Eden. Swamp Thing goes in, and fights a couple of worms. They fight uh, them with the, the, yeah, the, the things. Yeah, the All Father. Uh, they it fight. Turns him. out. Turns out. Oh yeah, it turns out. Do you want the me to worms say were actually oh, you got it. using the High Father man. Yeah, he was he was the slave the whole time. They, he wasn't, you know, they weren't following the worms weren't his servants. They were just using him because he knew that he could bring people there so they could eat them. Which begs the question, why like why go through all the effort to eat humans when they could just eat other things? I don't know, maybe humans just taste extra good. Humans better. And then he's like, we're going to preserve their knowledge, but then you kill them and now you don't feel bad about the fact that their faces are in a weird way kind of adorable. Yeah, see, I felt really bad when, like, Matt Cable stabbed that one in the eye. It's like, it didn't deserve that. It was just, like, following orders. And as far as it knows, it's not hurting anybody. But and then it turns out, no, they're evil. It's okay that he killed that one. Um, and then uh, he shoots Ruth. She, yeah, he she shoots, dies. Yeah, he goes crazy and starts, like, overloading the reactor or whatever. Shoots Ruth. Bolt, she dies. Bolt, Bolt, Bolt has a vendetta. I father, man. But then Swan Thing's like, okay, I don't have time for that. He just punches him and knocks him out. And he's yeah. like, all right, everyone, let's go. <laughs> yeah. And, uh... Yeah, they escape from the city. He's got bolts. Uh, Swamp Thing does his thing and disappears again after he gets everyone to safety. And then he finds oh, yeah, some this weird story. glowy gem with yeah. a seven-pointed yeah. star like, on story it. Ends. Story ends, and then he comes and he finds a giant, like, disco ball thing. And he's like, oh, what's this thing? And then he touches it, and then there's a dinosaur. <laughs> and he's yeah, back he, he, in the with prehistoric times. Well, it says that he gets – suddenly the world erupts into agony and kaleidoscopic colors. And then, yeah, next thing you know, he's standing wait, in front wait, of a no, dinosaur. No. No, no, no. <laughs> what? Swamp Thing's root-gnarled fingers brush the gemstone's <laughs> face, and suddenly the uh, world erupts into agony and kaleidoscopic colors. And when the writhing rainbow fades, the mossy man brute finds he has stepped into a nightmare. Next issue, the Eternity Man on the beautiful. Twilight Zone. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. All right. Within so the we just... scary door. <laughs> All right. We got two issues left. Should we just keep on rolling? Yeah, no, we're finishing. We're finishing discussing the original run. This was oh, yeah. supposed to be one episode. We just managed to turn it into two somehow. Are you even remotely surprised? I mean, no, I guess not. I shouldn't have be surprised. This is my favorite comic. Yeah, it's a good comic. I'm enjoying my favorite, it. My favorite it's DC my, character. Yes, as much as well, I nitpick it. What? Sorry, what? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, here's the thing. Um, it's it's still my favorite character, but I do I will admit readily it does not make nearly as much sense after the end of the second series. There's this first series of 24 issues, then there's the second series that's 171 issues, and then after that, it just, it's an endless cycle of being constantly, like, like, it's not really rebooted, but, like, not really having any clear idea of how any of the stories tie into each other. They just kind of happen all separate of each other, but then they kind of expect you to know who Swamp Thing is, and it's like, what is happening anymore? It's weird. Yeah. There's one continuous story from the first and second series, and then it's a weird, like, somewhat continuous, really broken up story after that. Because, like, the third series starts off, like, eventually it reveals what happened rela relative to the end of the second series, but it starts in a completely different spot that doesn't line up at all, 
and that didn't get explained until like 10 issues in. So it's like, what the heck? <laughs> but anyways, a dinosaur. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, issue 12, the Eternity Man. Not. Yeah, he's standing in front of a dinosaur Actually, and you get a... Narration. What? The Twilight Zone narration is saying it's a hallucination. Oh, yeah, so it's saying it's a hallucination, but then he's like, but is it really a hallucination? And, uh... Hallucination, perhaps, but this hallucination is a hungry one, and dinner seems almost within its reach. Yeah, and, uh, you get a beautiful shot of the Swamp Thing's ass, just, uh... <laughs> and the very lumpy T-Rex. Yeah, very lumpy T-Rex, but nothing lumpy about that ass, See, am I Mr. right? Redo <laughs> You're the worst. <laughs> Nesca Redondo... A, it's it's like a lumpier style almost. It's not ugly. It's not like those issues of Archie TMNT that were drawn by the one the intermediate artist. It's not like those. It's it doesn't look bad. It's just different look. Yeah, it just it looks very me, very organic, that, I guess. Well, honestly, the way that dinosaurs drawn kind of reminds me of the way that Bill Watterson used to draw dinosaurs before he realized how dinosaurs actually looked like. Like in the very yeah. first strips where he didn't quite have the anatomy of dinosaurs down, it kind of looks like that one. Yeah. Well, anyways, uh, let's let's get into this. this one. Honestly, you're probably gonna have to help me understand it because there's a lot I just didn't get. Um, Which part did you get? Well, we'll get to that. It, it this one's just confusing. So basically, uh, Swamp Thing rips up a branch and sticks it in this T Rex's mouth, and like you know, he fights the T. You know, it does like loop to the rancor. You know, tries to keep it from closing its mouth. Uh, there's a caveman. <laughs> yeah, then a caveman shows up with a spear axe combo thing, and like yes. just. Starts fighting the dinosaur, then Swamp Thing jumps in and breaks the dinosaur's leg, and the dinosaur rolls over and lands on the man, impaling him with his own spear. Yep. Oof. So and, yeah, uh, that guy dies, unfortunately. But and in, in like, his how eye... Is there, how is there even a man here? Yeah, he's like, humans aren't out. supposed to exist yet, and then he looks at uh, into the guy's eye, and there's like the shape of the seven-pointed star that's on the weird time travel gem. Yeah. So he goes, he goes to grab it. Yeah, he goes to grab then... the... Yeah. yeah, the gem flashes again, and then uh, you get a brief interlude where it shows, uh, what is it, Matt Cable and yeah, uh, Abigail. Like Cable, Abby, and Bolt, the guy from the last issue who's mad that... So he he basically, he's going to join the cast for a while. Yeah, also you, you're starting to cut out a little bit. You might yeah, I, I was on the side of my microphone instead of uh, in front of my microphone. I just yeah, had to adjust it. Yeah, sounds much better. But yeah, Bolt's, uh, Bolt's there, mad about I think they're at his wife's funeral. Uh, they're very sad, and he says, well, I can distract you if you come help me look for Swamp Thing. Wait, were they uh, married, or were they just dating? I don't know. He loved her, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all that's important. Anyways. Yeah. It was his girl, uh, as he puts it. She was, yeah, so yeah his he girl. Grabbed, he went um, up to grab the thing. He saw a quick image of the guy, and now all of a sudden he's in, what time period is this, Roman? Yeah, he's in a Roman, uh, he's like first he's century AD, I believe. Oh, yeah. Ancient Rome with gladiators. That's the time yeah. period. So yes, they start sometime fighting about him, but then they reveal. Then they find out the usual thing: you can't kill Swamp Thing with veg with, with um vegetables. <laughs> no, you can't kill Swamp Thing because he's a vegetable man. So yeah, yeah swords and pitchforks don't work on him. Yeah, so they release the lions on him. They release the man-eating lions, them. and um, yeah, he just punches and them and then breaks through a cage into the arena. And who does he find in the arena? Yeah, there's a guy with a blindfold. It turns out it's the guy from before. Yeah, it's the caveman. Pulls off a, yeah, I was a gladiator now he's in Rome. And then he's like, what? But I got rid of that gem. And, and then, then he, uh, he, yeah, then he, he sees dies. the gem in his eyes again. The... And then it turns out that the Colosseum man, Caesar, is this? Caesar, the... yeah, yeah, the Caesar. emperor, the emperor. He's got the gem. He sees the gem. The guy, the gladiator man turns out is not dead. Once again, stumbles away. Cut back to second interlude as it is so thusly labeled. Yeah. And uh, uh... bolts, he's like. He just tells him that he's going to... Abel, if you can follow me, then we, we're going to use your help to find the Swamp Thing. And then it cuts back to Swamp Thing, and now he's in a different town. Yeah, now he's in, in like, time. 1400s, uh, uh, right? The Black or 1300s. Plague. Yeah, mid-14th century, so 1300s. Time of the Black Death in Europe. Uh, they think that he's the personification of the Black Plague. So, of course, they try yeah, to kill him, set him on fire, which... Like yeah, say at least this time they're actually in the proper time period for that kind of thinking. Yeah. And then we find the man, and it turns out the man is back, and he's got the gem, and then... And, uh, who is he this time? He's... Oh, yeah, this is actually his origin story. This is when you find out that... Well, maybe you can explain it better, because this is where I got thoroughly lost. He made this woman love him, but... Hold so on, somehow... I'll just reread the pages really quick. Talk about something else. Well, I'll just try to give my recap of it, and then you can tell me where I'm wrong. So basically, uh, he gets this woman to love her. This woman is basically expositing that... 
he made her love him a lot, but only to steal his her immortality, which apparently she just has. Uh, the gem with the seven-point star is there, and he's stealing it, and basically she's telling him, uh, since you did this to me, like, now immortality is going to be your curse. You'll be immortal, but now when you want to die, like, you won't be able to. And every time you die, you'll get sent back to the beginning of time to relive it all. And that, I guess, is why we saw him as a caveman and then in ancient Rome. Because those are times that he's died and been sent back to the beginning, basically, in, like... He's basically playing life on hardcore mode, so every time he dies, he has to restart his file and go back to the beginning. And uh, The beginning of time. Yeah, let's go back to the beginning of time. But that what that doesn't explain then is like, how come when the caveman died, it just he just immediately got back up and started going again? Like that's he what you see. Dead. Well, he wasn't dead, but it's like he was dead. So like what she's saying is that when you die, you get sent back to the beginning of time. He's going all of these iterations, you're not. They're not showing us every iteration. They're showing us the ones that are. Relevant. I guess I don't know. But anyways, so it, who is this woman though? Why does she have this gem of immortality anyways? Is it mad? Does it matter? She's a I'm witch mad. that he bartered with. I guess so. Trade. Yeah. So basically, that's his hell that he's condemned to. Uh, the villagers with the pitchforks break in, and he can only be killed by the hand of a friend. And he, but he doesn't have friends. See, that's the irony. Yeah, because he's a he's a dick. He doesn't got friends. But you think in like literally it, living for eternities and starting over, you think you'd learn how to make a friend? I mean, if he, uh, no, uh, you ever you ever watch Gargoyles, man? No. Well, watch Gargoyles sometime and come back to me when you know about Demona. Okay. <laughs> Noted. Uh, but yeah, anyways, the village people break in and burn everything down, as always. Font thing saves the woman, but uh, then the serious. house burns down and the uh, man presumably dies again. Then uh, we get third interlude. In fact, if it wasn't for the Swamp Thing, we might all be dead, blown to Kingdom Come along with the Nails Underground City, as shown in detail last issue. Editor. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It's a little asides from the editor, just to let you know in case you missed something. Um, if you can see, yeah, that's exactly what it is for. Not everybody reads comic books every week. They may very well may have. Yeah, and that, that's kind of things. Like the, the, this comic has a lot, like really constant recaps. You know, every few issues they kind of reiterate his origin story. It's very much written in my, with the thought in mind that someone might just pick up an issue somewhere in the middle, and they made mm -hmm. it so it would be coherent for them to read. Yeah. That is oh, something they, they don't they do get, with modern comics. get a comics great anymore. moment here. Because, you know, Bolt's a black guy and Cable. So he's like, I, I, I've got to take my mat out on somebody. And he's like, why, Bolt? Because he's different. I think you're a bigot. And it's like, see, it's a, it's a point because he's a black guy, but he's being bigoted. It shows him. Yeah, well, it's also funny because, you know. It's like, commentary. Matt Cable's saying, you know, you're being a, like, you're just hating Swamp Thing because he's different. And I know because I hated him because he was different. Yeah. It's his character arc. It's Matt Cable's character arc. Um. But yeah, no, I was saying, uh, they don't do this with modern comics anymore, though. If you pick up a, go to any random comic book store, pick up the latest issue of Spider-Man, if you try to read that, you're not going to know what's going on, unless you've read, like, I mean, you might. No, that's, that's probably not, not a even, blanket statement. But. No, that's not even the main problem. The main problem is that they've had so many in-universe reboots by now, but they never class, they qualify, because, like, the reboot happened, but it's not really a reboot, because the stories still happen. They're still canon, but they don't matter anymore, but some of them are still canon, and everything gets rebooted unevenly. Yeah, it's the exact uh, thing that Doomsday Clock answer. tried to comment on, and yeah. we will certainly dive into that when we get it to just, that because Doomsday just Clock added is to it. Yeah, well, Doomsday Clock is something we will absolutely be discussing at some point. And uh, give you all a hint, it blows. Yeah, I mean, I need to reread before it I get blows. my. Uh, I need to reread it before I put my thoughts together fully. But yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't. Didn't care for it. Probably should have just uh, left it alone. I also need to read uh, Rorschach. I haven't read that yet, but I have all twelve issues now. Cool. Anyways, he's in the swamp. The guy's back with the gem. But he calls him a friend, so maybe. He's in the Civil War times. Oh, yeah, now he's in the Civil War times. The caveman guy that, you know, the, the guy that he keeps seeing is now a Civil War or a Union soldier on a horse. And, uh, yeah, Swamp Thing is in a swamp again. So he's back in his swamp, but now he's in, like, you know, 1700s. Or when, yeah, 1800s. Mm. Right, 18. That one's yeah. Civil War was eighteen hundreds. Anyways, uh, uh, the swan, the uh, I don't know what happens. The guy gets shot by the Confederacy, right? It's that one. Yeah. So basically, he shows up and he he, uh, he begs gets, Swamp Thing to kill him. Modern time. Well, you skipped it. So basically, he begs Swamp Thing to kill him because that would. Oh wait, no, that's not yet. That's not yet. 
But yeah, he basically gets killed by the Confederate soldiers. Another flash of light. They're back in modern times with the swamp. And now the guy's here, just looking like a normal dude in a jacket. Oh yeah, and final interlude. Uh, basically more of the same. <laughs> Matt Cable's character arc. Uh, yeah, are you, are you there? Help me out here. Which part? Oh, yeah, so final interlude. Yeah, uh, yeah they just drive the point home. Basically, Matt Cable's like, yeah, I know you're a bigot because I was one too. I felt the same way about Swamp Thing. And, uh, yeah, now Swamp Thing's in modern times. He knows that because he sees a plane fly overhead, but they're still in the swamp. Um, then, uh, the Eternity Man shows up again and begs Swamp Thing to kill him. And this is one of the rare times that Swamp Thing actually speaks. He tells him, I cannot kill. Um, well, he does that with ellipses. Well, he does that with yeah, ellipses. okay. Because it's very hard. See, that's one of the times when it's appropriate to use ellipses, because it's really hard for him to actually physically yeah. talk. But, uh, no, yeah, I basically. But, like, he, it's like, again, I just tend to gloss over it. It's yeah. like whenever I'm reading a fantasy novel, and then they have all the made-up words. I don't actually try to pronounce that in my head. I just kind of skip over it and understand what the word looks like. Oh, you'd have fun reading Dune, then. Why? Is it made up of a lot of that? <laughs> yeah. Shailud. Oh. Shailud. Uh, what else we got? Mu Muadib. Uh, Lisan al Gabe. <laughs> Anyways, they, the, yeah. the book has an actual he, dictionary in the back of it. He's dead, and then he covers up the gem, and he's like, well, I, he'll probably be back one day for it. Oh, yeah, well, you, you forgot what? to say how he died. He stumbled into some quicksand and quick sank and died. Sand. Yeah. And then, here's, uh, the thing. here's the thing. This, is, this one issue will later serve as the basis of an entire story arc, but only in theme, not in direct content. Well, I can't wait to get to that, because yeah. I was confused as heck reading this one. Well, the other time travel arc... Honestly, I feel like I'd be able to help you more if I actually reread the whole thing, but I'm I'm just going off of my memory of You're cutting out again. I'm going off of my memory of how I could count. That's much better. But yeah, basically <laughs> this, en this entire <laughs> Yeah, so this basically this entire comic just ended exactly where it began. He's in the swamp again. He's none the better for having this time travel ex exploration thing, but now we know that Matt Cable and Bolt and Abby are going to come look for Swamp Thing, and yeah. Bolt knows the swamp very well, apparently, so he will be very good at helping him do that, because I guess he was born and raised in the swamp. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, issue 13. <laughs> okay, I think that bit's over now. the giant snake and alligator, he's like... <laughs> All right. And that's how the issue ends. Yeah, so uh, basically, this is what you could call the season one finale, I guess. Uh, starts yeah. off in the swamp, Bolts and... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Bolts they're and looking for him, but... Um, yeah, Cable and company are in a speedboat looking for Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing's fighting yeah. a bunch of mutants. Yeah, he's fighting a big frog mutant, the alligator mutant from issue 11, and a snake mutant. See, this is why they're like, where do these creatures come from? It's never explained. It, it, this is just one of those things that never gets brought up again after the fact. And then he's like, ah, uh, 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 maybe I can use this to cure my condition. Yeah, but then they but show then up and uh, they... Cable and Bolt and Abby and then some fourth guy who's also here. Yeah, professor, guess, you, professor guess who's not going to survive to the end of the issue? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, really. Which one? <laughs> yeah, which one? These three well-established characters, or this fourth one? We're just throwing in with no, <laughs> no yeah, explanation. He's just here now. Yeah, Professor De Grace. Oh, yeah. I'm sure he's very well threshed him. now. Yeah, they they t they throw nets at him. He rips right through him, and then they use the glue guns from Prey to immobilize him, yep. and capture him, take him back to the Fenwick Military Academy in DC, and uh, they've got him captive there. They got him in a little terrarium. Uh, they're all there talking about what to do. DeGrays wants to... Yeah, DeGrays wants to study him and then basically kill him and send him to the Smithsonian. Yeah, they got him locked up in a cage that has a swamp... Like, it looks like a museum terrarium. Yeah, and then Swamp Thing busts right out because he's, you know, a badass. Yeah, he's Swamp Thing. And then, um... In the twist of the century, DeGrays... Oh, they start shooting at Swamp Thing. I'm still trying to figure out how this is... How this is all related to the deaths of Alec and Lily Ho Linda Holland. I've got to figure it out. And then Swamp Thing's mad, breaks out. They try shooting him. That doesn't yeah. work. Then yeah. the doctor, well, for the for like the third or fourth time in this comic, a dude runs in front of somebody and gets shot. And he's yeah, like, he tries no, to take a bullet for Swamp Thing. <laughs> too valuable to science. <laughs> yeah, plot twist of the century, Professor DeGrays dies. 
full eight pages of screen time. <laughs> um, I yeah, mean, he's honestly, dead. It's like I, I love when characters do that. It's like when a character takes a bullet for Superman, and it's like you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, uh, yeah, he gets foamed again. Put back in the cage, only this time they got lasers around it, so he really oh, can't escape. Oh, it kind of looks like red ropes, though. Yeah, but it's supposed to be lasers. I think they knew it looked like red rope, because they literally had someone say, the hydroponic chamber, and installed a system of high-potency laser beams around it. If a creature attempts a second escape, it will never attempt a third. Yeah. So it'll die. So, yeah, basically, Swamp Thing is yeah. now back in captivity. Uh, they're all mad, and Swamp Matt Cable's like, well, hey, you know what? I'm just going to go and try to talk to him. So he puts he puts on a suit and goes in there to talk to him, and then uh, just tells him, like, uh, basically, like, uh, you you must know something about Alec and Linda Holland, and then that's, you know, big big turning point and moment for the series. He doesn't talk. Yeah, he gets mad because like, he doesn't talk. Well, and, I can't tell anyone else about the formula. It's too dangerous if anybody else does. And then he finally reveals to him that he's Alec Holland, and then it's like, oh, my gosh. What a twist. And uh, yeah, Matt Cable then is like pretty distraught to hear that, you know, I and mean, I guess Swamp Thing. And I mean, okay, so they, they basically say that they give us the Cliff Notes version. They tell him that he basically just retells the story of how he came to be here. Can you imagine how many hours that must have taken with Swamp Thing's like slow speech? Well, yeah. Slowly, he used his rarely uh, used voice. It's like, yeah, no, they're Little skipping more than over a bubbling so rasp. We have to go through that. Yeah, apparently, so I always heard of him pictured his voice being like this big booming voice when he talks, hey, but... In your head, what voice actor voices Swamp Thing? Well, until I read this comic, it was probably like, I don't know, uh, drawing a blink on his name. Why am I drawing? It's Darth Vader's voice actor. What's it? Why can't Andrew I... Jones? Yeah, that's the one. Thank you. I pictured his voice, kind of. But after this one, they explained that he talks in a, what, a, um, what, barely a bubbling rasp. So I kind of picture him sounding more like Dr. Manhattan in the Watchmen movie. See, in my voice, he was—he always sounded more like Clancy Brown. Yeah, I, I don't know. But, you know, yeah, apparently he talks very quietly, which I guess is fitting, since... I mean, he can't talk loudly right now. Well, because, I mean, like, every time he talks, it's in big, bold text. But, oh, I guess maybe, I guess, this is maybe him whispering, because he doesn't want to be heard. I don't know. Uh, anyways, that's beside the and point. He, he tells he him a story. He tells Abby about it, and then he he's tells like, Abby well, everything. We both film his lives. Then we get a nice little continuity shot of all the villains that from the previous issues and all and, the times that he saved them. Yeah, as seen in previous issues of this magazine, as the yeah. little asterisk note says. Like, we're going to get him out of there or die trying. And so they dress up in spyware. Yeah, they put on their spy suits and gas masks and gloves. And they go in yeah. there and they gas bomb the place to knock out the guards. And then they uh, throw a grenade at the cage and break Oops, Swamp Thing yeah. out. Bolt here because he's still mad at Swamp Thing. And yeah, they're like, just about to make their escape, and then Bolt stops like him with a gun him. and is like. And then, you know, he punches him, and then Swamp Thing steps in. He's and like, yeah, no. Like, yeah. It turns out that he's Swamp Thing. And once more, Matt Cable relates the <laughs> astonishing tale he himself had heard only hours before. And it's like, yeah, we don't need to show that all again. Yeah, so. And then the Bolt so now like, Bolt's oh fully up to speed. Yeah. Bolt's all up to speed now and all in with helping. Uh, he helps him escape. Or I guess, no, now we cut to a funeral. It's the funeral for Mr. DeGray's, which Matt Cable just conveniently was put in charge of earlier in the in the issue. Right after he died, the director guy just told him, uh, yeah, you're in charge of his funeral, which apparently is one of Cable's responsibilities. Yeah. Um, but we'll really it's just funeral. because but really it's just yeah. because they needed some way for Swamp Thing to get out of DC. Yeah. And well, how well, did they I do can't. it? It's too bad the Swamp Thing got destroyed in all that big fight and such, but it turns out that actually he was in the coffin that they just buried, and he now that world thinks he's dead. Yeah, which, okay, so Swamp Thing says that apparently there was a false bottom on DeGrace's coffin, and he hid inside of that so that he could break out once they were all gone and crawl to the surface, which, you know, that's exactly what he does. He claims that he weighs 547 pounds. Yeah, and then that coffin is not, it looks just big enough for one person. Swamp Thing yeah, is whatever. much bigger than even one person. How did he fit in that coffin, and how did the Paul Bearers well, not realize Matt, that this coffin weighed a few hundred pounds Matt too extra? Cable, Matt Cable was in charge of the funeral, so he got a giant, elaborate coffin, and then they thought, but he made it out of cheap materials, so they thought that the coffin was really heavy, because giant, and elaborate, and not because it's made of cheap materials. <laughs> I don't know. That's it's a why. bit of a bit of a plot hole. He's in the whatever. gravestone, and he's like, "Well, thank goodness. Now I just have to meet up with Cable, and the government thinks I'm dead." But then he sees the gravestones of Alec and Linda Holland, and he's like, "Oh crap! It's all coming back to me." <laughs> he's like, "Oh yeah, I'm supposed to be sad," and then he, he remembers. Sad about it. 
And then he basically says, well, I've realized now I'm a burden to anybody. So instead of going, yeah, like, I'm just, yeah. yeah. There's, nothing, there's nothing that he can actually do to cure my problem. And me being around him would just cause him problems. So you know what? I should probably just retreat to the swamp and just be there for a while. And then we get the final line of the comic. And and if tears could come, they would. And it says the end. So it's because it's like it's the end of the Len Wine run. But it's like it's it's a it, it calls back. Those are the final words of the original Swamp Thing short story. So it's basically like the conclusion of this run. And it's kind of an ending to the story. But there's more. There's so yeah, much more. A lot more happens. But yeah, that's uh, first. That's the Len Wine run. The, Le- the Wine Writes in Redondo run. It was it was it was a good one. I liked it, but yeah, there's some weird Nick picks in there that we went over. During this but, story, I mean, we went from gothic horror, we had some cosmic horror, and then we started getting like, sci-fi. Some sci-fi in there. Yeah. Now, I'll, I will tell you, the the second half of the original series is a lot more pulp sci-fi than it is uh, gothic horror. Well, I, I for one can't wait. Yeah. We got, we got pulp sci-fi, then we got like con- adventure comic mixed in with horror elements, then we got just straight up horror comic for a while. <laughs> After Alan Moore takes over. Yeah, well... Uh, really, the horror starts in, like, issue 16. It really... It doesn't start with Alan Moore. It starts at the tail end of the Plaskow run when Stephen Bissett and John Totalbin take over art duties. Yeah, well, uh, we, we did it. I think we found that six to seven episodes or issues per episode is our number. Of course, I mean, this I one is now... We uh, might this... figure this out later. How long is this episode? An hour and thirty-one minutes right now. Oh my gosh! We we did it though. We covered the first thirteen issues and we had a good time doing it. We made lots of friends along the way and we learned that friendship was the real treasure all along. <laughs> Should we cue the hey, outro music or do you got more to say? I don't know, man. Look, the, I just can't believe it took us so long to talk about thirteen issues you, and it's like holy do you crap. Even, do you even know us? I know us. I just this does not surprise just, me in the least. I'm thinking about the future, and it's like, oh no. Well, I guess now we know that you know we can record an episode every seven issues I finish. We don't have to necessarily wait for me to. Yeah. I'm a slow reader. Well, so. okay. I will. I will tell you though, straight up. Um, after you finish my omnibus, the amount of stuff. Once we get to like the single issues, you'll probably have to start using the internet at that point, so that I can also reread them. Do you know? You know what I do? I'll tell you off mic. You know what I do though, right? I know, I know how you you got like digital copies of some of them. Well, no, not digital copies. There's a there are websites that have basically a digital archive of almost every comic you could think of, and that's where I where I that's where I look up stuff that I, the comic is either too rare to come across or I just don't have access to a copy at the moment. I I don't know. So yeah, you, we might we we'll have to use. That's what I was using today, since you have my omnibus and I don't have my copies of those issues. Well, hey, you own legal copies. I say it's it's fine. Anyways. No, I know. No, I'm just saying, like, later, though. We'll figure it out. I, if unless, I like these enough, I might even just buy them. Uh, that might if, not be possible. Uh, yeah, I don't even want to know how much this... How much did this omnibus cost? Oh, that? That one's not too bad. Um, you could probably find it for, like, 60 bucks. No, that's not horrible. It's a lot of content for 60 bucks. Well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, 24... Well, this one... Doesn't this one get me up to the Alan Moore run? Yeah, it's, it's like, 45 issues total. Ah, well, there you go. I own, I own a few of the Alan Moore ones. Anyways, we can talk about all that off off mic. Um, the original yeah. series, you got you got the 24 issues, the first 19 issues of the second series, and then the first annual, which is just an adaptation of the Swamp Thing movie by Wes Craven, which <laughs> I have not seen and probably we, won't see. We, no, we, we need to see that. We need to. I can't watch it. Uh, anyways, we'll figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> I all feel right, like that well, would be a fun discussion to have someday, but we'll figure it out. Um, yeah. Anything else to say uh i don't know i guess maybe next week probably take a break from swamp thing next week oh I, I, yeah no rest be sure like we're not this isn't we're, gonna be like every week or anything but we will be going through the whole swamp thing stories that will, will happen who knows how long it'll take if you're uh if you're here for this it's too late to turn back you've already committed get ready to having to spend at least by the end of this a collective like 60 hours of your life listening to all of this. Well, I mean, it's a podcast, though. You could listen while you go for a run or, you know, ride a bike or grocery shop. You know, it's a podcast. It's great. Yes. Oh, we need to we need to figure that out. We need to, like, see, this is also why I think we need to have, like, a site separate from YouTube. It's so that people can download the episodes if they want. 
Uh, we could even use Discord for that potentially. Anyways, I mean, well, you, you can. There are ways to download things off of YouTube, but it's just it's sometimes it can be a hassle. It'd be much easier if there's just a download link from a separate site because I believe in making sure that everything can be archived yeah, as well, easy as possible. We'll figure that out off mic. Uh, anything else to say to the lovely people? Or do know. we have five fans yet, or how many are we? What up episode to? is this? Four. Well, I mean, if if you really think about, it, we have no fans yet. Nobody these, but I guess by the time this is posted. This is both in the past and the future. At the time this is posted, that's when it comes. That's when we have five fans. So you know what? This let's is call it. Four. Let's just let's just say is, uh, it's the fourth episode. You know what? I'm making it official. Goodbye to all of you, our five fans. That's the name of the fan base now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> the five fans. All right. Should I cue the outro music? Yeah, cue the outro music. We can just. Is it going? It's going. We really. I. It would be so much better if I could hear it. Yeah, maybe the, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Maybe there's gotta be a way to do that. I can't, I can't hear it. Ah, whatever. It's over. Bye. <laughs>